Hi, I'm Phil Pollucha from Billionaires in Boxers, and you are about to engage with Up Level Your Communication, hosted by Maluna. Wow, this is going to be powerful. Communication is at the heart of everything that is good about business and about sharing with your fellow humans, and Maluna is phenomenal at helping you share that message and also interview some pretty special and amazing guests too. Check it out right now. Welcome to Up Level Your Communication. I'm your host, Dr. Miluna Bausch. On this show, I will be interviewing some of the most interesting business people in the world. We'll focus on up leveling your communication and leadership skills so that your voice can be heard and you can make an impact in the world. Doctor. Welcome to Up Level Your Communication. From actor to stunt woman to motocross to investor and more, when my guest today tells people what she does, they frequently say, you do what? <laughs> Stay tuned to hear how this smart, gorgeous, Self-declared overachiever is uplifting women and humanity by doing it her way. From beautiful Washington State, it is my pleasure to welcome Carol Carpenter to the show. Hello, Carol. Hi, Maluna. Thank you for having me. Briefly tell us who you are and what you do in your words. Well... I have Moto Vixens, which is what you were, you know, speaking about earlier. And Moto Vixens is the uh, road racing portion of what I do. And I've been doing it now for 13 years. Um, yeah, it's quite a while, isn't it? Um, and I also have uh, two other companies. Actually, I have five altogether, but presently three that I'm running. And it is Selenian Strategy Group, and we help individuals, advise them, help them build their businesses, create a strategy, and then we help them with an actionable plan. And then we also have Iron Dog Media, which we do branding, we do logos, oh geez, media kits, websites, e-commerce without e-commerce. So, you know, along the way, um, I found a need for people and I needed it. So I figured, you know, start a business with it. That's how Moto Vixens came about, actually. So it just goes in line with what I've done over the years. I love it. Moto Vixens. You got to love that name and that branding. It's it just conjures up an image that's unforgettable. Well, Maluna, I'll tell you, in the start of it, it was just me being cheeky, right? I was like, I want to stand out. I want to do it my way. So I'm going to name this company Moto Vixens. And I'll tell you, in the beginning, it was a hindrance because the association was I only did women's track days. And so it took a, lo a long time for people to figure out that this was for all riders of all levels. So, you know, me being cheeky didn't work out in the beginning, but I, you know, I, I, I persevered. And then eventually there was this um, change in the industry where women were now um, being targeted for marketing. And I was just in the right, right place at the right time at that moment. I love it. Sometimes the wit or being cheeky pays off. <laughs> Maybe to take a little longer. So there you there you are, right place, right time. Now, you had an interesting background, maybe a little more interesting than some folks, being in two separate, very different cultures, actually. How did your upbringing affect how you approach your business and the person you've become? So I, I besides my cultures um, being different, uh, I was the first born American, yeah, American born Chinese in the U.S. I'm actually Taiwanese, but you know, you know, just potatoes, potatoes. 
And I also had two religions within my family. My dad's side is Buddhist. My mom's side is uh, Presbyterian. So I had two pretty different cultures and two very different religions. And so I also was bilingual. So, you know, I grew up kind of screwed up because (laughs) I was, you know, born in the States. I just wanted to fit in and I didn't fit in, you know. And so I think what doesn't um, destroy you makes you stronger. And the differences that we have actually are advantages. And but I didn't know that when, you know, when you're young, you don't know that. And all you want is acceptance and approval, right? Those are two basic needs. And so you end up conforming and never, I think, never really become your true self until later in life. When you discover the things that, you know, people made fun of are the things that are now your strengths. You make great points. I I can certainly relate to all of that. I never fit in. When you're young, that's all you want. You don't understand. And it is, those are our greatest gifts that we don't fit in. We create our own world. We belong to ourselves. And that's when everything changes. You were studying to be a doctor. So tell us how you went from wanting to practice medicine to racing. So... Growing up, obviously, Asian family, right? And for us, it's about duty and honor to the family. And the way they raised me was, you're either going to be a doctor, a lawyer, or some musical prodigy, right? So we all learn how to play an instrument, mostly piano, right? When we start, I know this is so stereotypical, but... You know, we all learned and I learned I learned all kinds of things. I mean, I was piano, violin, uh, flute. Right. And then, of course, you're not just musical. You're good at mathematics because music and mathematics has a, you know, a relation. Um, So I did really well in math and science. So automatically they kind of pigeonholed me into you're going to be a doctor. Well, you know, I mean. Part of the Asian culture is listening to what your parents want and desire for you. So that's the route I I went on. And then my mother passed away when I was 20. So it it became a, do I really want to go down this road? Is it really what I want to do? And that was difficult for me because I, I... I spent all those years growing up, just all I did was study to be a doctor. And then all of a sudden, I found myself possibly not wanting to pursue that career. So I ended up changing my major to business after she passed because I realized that wasn't my passion anymore, Mm -hmm. right? And it just, it's funny how life unfolds and evolves. I was working for a high-tech firm. I met my husband, now ex-husband, and I ended up doing what I never said I was going to do, which was get married and have kids, right? (laughs) Never say never. (laughs) Because it's so crazy. D&D. I always said the same thing. I did get married, but I I stayed away from from the child thing. So there we go. Well, I hear you. (laughs) You know, I hear you. Yeah. Never say never because yeah. things change, yeah. don't they? And we change and grow. It's true. It's true. Now, just for a moment, I've I've only been in race cars. I've never been uh, on a fast little bike. Oh, it's exciting. Mm, would you take us for a ride for a minute? Oh, Lord. What are we riding? How fast are we going? And what does it feel like? So I ha- I have a lot of bikes. Um, you must, yeah. It's it's an I call it an addiction. It it, it is really a, a, an expensive one at that. <laughs> so uh, my favorite to ride on the street happens to be my Ducati eight, eight or eight EVO. Mm. Right, beautiful bike. I oh. love it. I love it. I take it on the track um, a handful of times, and. I didn't enjoy it there because I was afraid I was going to get hit, right? So you can't ride with that mentality. So I ended up just having 
bikes that were dedicated to the track. So I have three Cowie 636s. And those are my track bikes. One of them is completely track ready. Another one, um, I sponsor a racer who happens to be my boyfriend, but I sponsored him before he became my boyfriend. (laughs) And then another one that we have for instruction. So I have all of them. Which one do you want to hear about? Take me on on the, you you call it Cowie. So we got to speak racing language here. Thank you. Uh, the one that you've gone the fastest on to date, would you take us on that one? Sure. Um, so that one is completely, you know, completely track ready. And it's, you know, it's sprung to my weight. Everything is, you know, modified because I am not the same size as, say, a six foot one man that weighs over 275 pounds. Right. It just it doesn't work. So everything's been modified. So I can get and squeeze the most performance out of the bike, including suspension. So, uh, yeah, and it's it's fun. Once you dial it in and you feel at one with the bike, all of a sudden you're not worrying about anything. You're not worried about traction. You're not worried about how it's going to load. Everything starts to work in this beautiful synergy that feels a little bit like like a dance. You're dancing with the bike on the track. And it is such an an exhilarating feeling. And I mean, it's not as simple as that, because of course, there's, there's the uh, technical parts of it, right, where you you yourself have to be very well educated on how to enter a corner, hit the apex and exit it, and then be already set up for the next corner. We're always looking two corners ahead. So if you've missed what you were the target you were trying to hit, you're you're basically for the next two corners making up for it. And mm. very much if you think about it, and, and there's been a lot of similarities to motorcycles and business for me, it it's there's a relationship in how uh in the mindset, right? You're always looking forward. We say you never look back on the racetrack because you're not going that direction. So we should never be looking back. We should always be looking forward. Great advice. How fast are we going? Oh, Lord. Okay. It just depends. If you go the straight, and depending on the bike that you have, I have a 636, and it's pretty powerful for what it is. It's been mapped and and tuned to go fast. So I've never looked down at the speedometer, but the times I have, I've been around 178 down the straight. <laughs> That's the exhilaration right there. Thank you for taking us around the track with you. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Where do you see motorcycle racing headed for women and and the folks that you work with? Are there changes coming? What what do you see? Well, I see um, an obscure sport now becoming more popular. And I think one of the reasons happens to be, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm plugging this, Netflix and what they did for Formula One. Yes. Right. And because now people are cheering on for these little stories, not not little stories, big stories. I mean, there's a lot of money in in Formula One, but um, yes, a ton. Way more than bikes, by the way. So yeah, it's way more. Yeah. <laughs> There's a, a lot more stuff that you know. Between tires alone, they far exceed what we would spend on tires. You know, so. But I think the popularity, watching the different um, teams, their stories, how there's a change of uh, rider or sorry drivers. It's the same in the motorcycle world. So as that gains popularity, I think people have kind of started to adapt and accept, you know, uh, motorcycle road racing. I love it. You know, I'm a Formula One fan. And yes, Netflix has done amazing things for a sport that was not so popular, especially in this country. And nothing like a TV series to bring it front and center. Yeah. All the drama. 
It's very <laughs> dramatic. I, I think it's more dramatic than their real lives. You don't hear a lot of scandal about Formula One drivers. They're too busy. Yeah. It's such a discipline, it, as you know, to get to this level of performance is I extraordinary. Have a ton of respect for them because it's not just mental. I mean, it goes beyond that. You have to, you physically, you have to be like a well tuned machine yourself. I think it's the highest form. As you said, physically, mentally, emotionally, you've got to know that car and what a piece of technology that is. Right. Nonstop changes at that speed. Yeah. The speeds and, they're and going. By the way, that changes per track they're at. And it's the same for bikes. Depending on the track you're at, you know, you, you either run it tall or you run it short. And, and even the weather for us, yeah. it makes a big deal because of the air intake that we get in the bikes. If it's too hot, bikes don't run as efficiently and bikes have a temperature range. They really love to run it. We're learning about bikes here, folks. Do you love it? To my audience, some of you are racing fans already. Now you say it's never too late to follow your dreams. And I love this sentence. The gift is in the unexpected. Please tell us more about that. Motorcycles was never a part of my life, ever. And and if you had asked me or told me this was going to be what I would end up doing, I would have told you you were completely off your rocker, you know? Uh, motorcycles didn't actually come into my life until I got divorced because there was there was this feeling of hopelessness when I got divorced. And it was the same feeling I had when my mother had passed. And back then I was in my, tw you know, I was 20. Um, when I divorced, I was in my 40s. It was two decades later. And to feel in your 40s like you don't know where you're going and you're lost was a horrible place to be. Now, my mother also passed when she was 47. And so by then I was what, like maybe 42 and I was sitting there thinking, and because, you know, she died of cancer, I was already told my chances of having cancer were far more um, increased. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just started thinking, how, how do I feel about this? I'm 42. I haven't accomplished anything of any significance. And if I die when I was 47, if I followed that path, have I done everything I wanted to do? And I could tell you right now that was a resounding no. So I just created a bucket list. And that's actually how it all started. And I took lessons and I'm an overachiever. So it wasn't good enough that I learned and I was practicing. I figured if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it at a level that even I'll surprise myself. That's so exciting. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Examining one's own life. Now, how do you define success? What does it mean to you? Success means to me that I've influenced and affected a lot of people. I get to do that when I do my track days. And I put on these events and we have people come and learn. Some of them are fairly new. Some of them are advanced, right? They're, they're also racers and they're there to get actual track time and practice. So I feel like in doing that, I've been very successful at affecting a lot of lives. And I know that successful people such as yourself we observe and we learn and we follow examples of others. Who are your sheroes and heroes? Oh, my sheroes would be, um, and they have since passed, obviously, my mother and my grandmother. And my mother was very strong and she was very quiet and demure. And then my grandmother was exactly the opposite. She was a maverick and loud and boisterous. So I feel like they gave me the best of both of them, and I got to combine the two. Those are my sheroes. My heroes are the men in my life that 
have proven otherwise, because I obviously am in a, a sport that's male dominated, but men in general have given me more opportunities than the women I've encountered. So the men in my life happen to be um, Dan Vega and Chase Barfield. Fantastic. Fantastic. Opportunities coming. And this show, as you know, is about communication. So I've got to ask you a question about, you have many roles, businesswoman, entrepreneur, speaker, author, track days, so many things, and a mother, many, many roles. How do you communicate successfully in each of your roles? Or do you look at it all the same? I look at, look at it all the same. Pardon me. Um, I speak from my heart. And I believe in integrity. And I, I lead by that. So when I speak, I speak keeping other people's dignity in mind. Ooh. And... You never speak down to people. I, I think that that shows who you are as a person. So if if I'm going to speak to somebody, I'm going to speak to them like I wish to be spoken to, with respect. It's beautiful. Indeed. I want a return to civil, respectful <laughs> communication. And that that's my story. That's my work in the world. I appreciate what you said. We don't, yes, what you said, speaking down to someone or being disrespectful says something about us, doesn't it? Our character, integrity, or lack thereof. It speaks volumes, doesn't it? It does. Now, you've done so many things. What's still on the, now, I usually say promise list because I don't want to kick the bucket. (laughs) <laughs> so, <laughs> so don't want to do that anytime soon. My my words are slightly different. What's still on that list for you? What are you gonna do next? What well, I, I I honestly don't know, but there are a couple of companies in the works right now, and one of them that I'm looking and I hope we can do a TV show from. And the other one is health-based, and it's based around uh, my Asian culture uh, and herbal medicines. That Because um, I believe that everything that we need to heal ourselves is here on this earth. So we, you know, the earth is the bounty that we're supposed to, you know, take from so that we can make ourselves better. And I think there's just too much of a quick fix mentality. And it, I hate this, but people take uh, prescriptions like they're Tic Tacs. And there are uh, repercussions for, and consequences that you have to face for taking them. And it does mess with your body, the chemistry, and the hormones. And those are things that you pay for later. And you may not be fully aware of them and... Right now, it's, you know, fixing the quote-unquote problem. Now, Western medicine has its place. Eastern medicine has its place. So I'm not saying that there there shouldn't be any of, say, one or the other. I just say that there's there can be a synergy. Mm, exciting. Oh, exciting. When you're not working, <laughs> do you have hobbies? What else do you love in your life? that makes you happy and fulfilled. Maluna, I I have a lot of facets to me and I know every human being does. I am fortunate enough that I get to wear a lot of different hats and all those hats are passions that I have. So a lot of my hobbies are intertwined with my work. It makes me happy. I understand that. And I, I can see, based on what you've said, all the facets and everything connects together under the umbrella. Yeah. I love that. Call it the umbrella of your <laughs> your empire, your businesses. Now, for the audience, our audience that wants to know more, what are the best ways to connect with you, Carol? Uh, they can go on to carolcarpentermedia.com and there's a contact 
area that you could fill in. And if you have any questions, inquiries, anything, reach out to me there. And it's a beautiful media kit. <laughs> and you heard her say at the beginning, she needed one and went to build a business around this. So if you want a, an example of an unbelievable media kit and website that, take a look at Carol's media page, plus photos of her acting, racing, stunt womaning. Is that a word? Stunt womaning book, television show, and so many of the things that she has created and put together. Carol, it's been such a pleasure. Is there anything you want to say before we wrap up this podcast episode today? Live life like it's an adventure. Be curious and share it all with friends. Have fun. You heard it here, folks. Have fun. Share it with friends. Oh, yes. Words of wisdom. Thank you so much for sharing your life, your heart, your generosity and spirit here with us today. Thank you for having me, Melina. And folks, don't forget to stay tuned and subscribe for another episode of Up Level Your Communication coming your way soon. We'll say bye for now. Thanks for watching. Be sure to share our show with the key leadership at your company and with your friends. If you know in your heart that you're ready to up-level your speaking, stage presence, and impact, visit milunafausch.com to schedule a complimentary call. You can also purchase my book and our podcast music, Strong Body. Doctor. Thank you for enjoying this content by Billionaires in Boxes. If you would like to be a guest or a host, be sure to get in contact with us at billionairesinboxes.com.